It is the last session of the day. We will have cocktails <laughs> up here. Welcome, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me, Peter. You've been on this stage fairly recently, and the last time you were here, you were running a &E. &E. I was. And then pretty shortly after that, you took this job. I did. So it's like a year and a half on the job now? Yeah, just 18 months, just 18 months. Uh, I'm not supposed to ask you about cocaine in the bathrooms, frat boy <laughs> behavior, yeah. any of the but sins of Vice to. Media. Yeah, I will but ask you. To, yeah. uh, but here's, here, I, here's why I think it's fair to ask about Vice Media's past incarnations. One, it's still built, in, built into the brand. Mm -hmm. That's what people think about. Um, and also, you were putting money into Vice while that behavior was going on. Yeah. Um, so I know that you don't like having to explain that it's a different company now, but talk about just your thought process going into that job, going into this thing that in some ways you sort of helped create. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I would characterize it as some, in some ways we helped create, but. You funded it, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that by the time we got there, a lot of that evolution had already started to change. The, um, the not suitable for work category was, you know, being taken down. The news division had started. The HBO show had was well on its way. The Emmy trajectory was on its way. We didn't get there until after, you know, right before the cable channel was going to start. So our entry point was essentially the cable channel, mm -hmm. um, which was, I guess, almost four or five years ago now. And so, you know, a lot of the 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 myth was i think you know even earlier than that but it was um, a, it was a myth that Shane played into it was absolutely. the guy who showed up absolutely. drinking on stage it was part of the part of the part of the character part of the lore um, that you know you bootstrap it until you make it sort of um, and i think that you know what was the question <laughs> <laughs> i was asking about you taking this job yeah why I, you know i think why and what, what did you think you were getting into well, I, you know, I, as entering cable a million years ago, I was just about to have my 20th anniversary at A&E when I decided to leave. And, you know, cable's obviously going through a lot of changes right now as well. And when I joined, you know, A&E and cable, History Channel was just about five years old. And all we listened to, or all I listened to when that happened was, Broadcast versus cable, broadcast versus cable. Cable was, ir was irrelevant. Cable would never make it. Cable couldn't do, you know, what broadcast could do. It would yep. never reach the sort of cultural pinnacle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and to be able to sort of take that journey at a relatively small, you know, cable portfolio, you know, relative to some of our peers, and, and, and watch the trajectory of things like, you know, Pawn Stars and Intervention and Hatfields and McCoys and Vikings and, um, you know, R. Kelly and, and culturally defining shows and the evolution of people saying you can't do something and then watch that thing happen yep. is something that's very motivating to me. Um, and, you know, here you have a situation where um, the consensus is that digital, whatever that means, because I think that that word is sort of antiquated right now and we're, we're yet again in a vocabulary moment because everything is digital, is... I think digital right now means doesn't operate or own a TV. Network. Yeah, I mean, but... Or would like to, or would like to be bought by one. I mean, if I said to my kids, what's digital, they couldn't tell you. Right. And that's Probably how I look at it. Either, they couldn't... Right? Well, they could, yeah. but they, that's not, the television isn't the television in the traditional sense. It's, you know, I've been in a room of, of college students before and said, you know, who watches television and, or, you know, cable and nobody raises their hand, you know, who watches this show and everybody watch, raises their hand. So they, it's a yep. vocabulary problem, right? Um, and so I think that being faced with that challenge of, having an opportunity to go participate in reshaping what media is going to look like yet again was super exciting to me. Like, there's no question that we are in a time of massive upheaval and change right now that we haven't seen in 20, 30 years. And I could either stay and, you know, ride it for margin and for cost cuts and for stability, yep. 
or I could go and see if I could participate in shaping what something might look like for the future. So I get the idea of joining digital platforms and there, and, and again, this was by the time you joined Vice and Vox. And, and it also Buzz has Speed had, had a cable and also had, right. yeah. But there was, a, there was a, a couple years where people were very excited about, at least especially investors were excited about the prospects of companies like ours and yours. Mm -hmm. It cooled off. And then specifically with Vice, it seemed to have a bunch of issues. So what were the issues that you were aware of going in? Oh, I was not choosing the, e the easier path, but definitely. Um, you know, I was aware that, you know, there was a lot of, there had been revenue misses. I was aware that obviously I came in after the New York Times article. Mm -hmm. So I was completely, we were all aware of the repercussions and the cultural um, challenges of that, and I, I knew I was stepping into um, a really morale beaten up organization. Um, I, I don't think I was as aware of as much leadership change needed to happen, um, and I don't think I was as aware of as much operational um, restructuring that needed to it happen. It was messier than you thought when you got there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I would say messier, complicated would be, you know, the word that I would use. I mean, I spent the first 30, it was probably three months, 90 days or so really just listening because one of the things that I was really struck by was, you know, people's inability to describe vice. Like, what is it? And, and you'd get what is vice different answers, right? And, what is it today? And in listening to, to that, I just, you know, really sort of zeroed in on, we have to explain it. Our employees couldn't explain it. Externally, we couldn't explain it. And it's five lines of business. We have five distinct lines of business. So we have a global studio. We have a news division. Um, we have a, you know, a TV division. Um, we have an agency, and we have a digital. And, and this year, for the first time heading into 2020, they'll each have global P&Ls not be run regionally. Because the old sort of like, media insidery way to describe Vice was it's an ad agency mm -hmm. with some websites and TV attached. Yeah. Was that was that a fair way of describing yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, I think digital was always what you heard. Yeah. And, and oh, it made some TV shows. And it had, an, it had branded entertainment. I mean, you, you heard a different thing. And I often wouldn't hear studios. And that was the aha for me that we definitely have that. We also have Pulse, um, which is a, a rapidly growing um, you know, part of the business that is also in the studios group by right? Thomas Bensky's company. Um, and so the, the business is much more complicated than people realize and has taken, you know, I would argue we've done a pretty good job of getting our arms around it in a short period of time, but it wasn't just, oh, take it, you know, figure out this digital company. It was, oh, figure out all five of these businesses are all five of these sustainable? How do all five of these work together? Should they work together? And what's the new Vice Media Group going to look like? And, and just to get a just to get a sense of where things stood, you guys raised two hundred and fifty million dollars. It's all debt, right? Yeah, we haven't this taken ring. all of it. Announce that round. Generally, not you don't want to be out raising money for a media company in mm -mm. twenty nineteen. So, did you know you were going to need that money? No. So when do you figure out, oh my gosh, we got to raise a big pile of money? Pretty much right after I got there. How, how, is that, how is that information conveyed to you? Oh, by the way, we're running out of money? Well, once you start looking at everything and you sort of see the, the you know, you do the analysis on the burn, and um, but also the growth and how the viability of all of these businesses and what needs to be done. and. Um, and my commitment to actually wanting to sustain all five of the businesses, that's when I said, okay, we're going to need to raise. And was there any discussion about that? Like, maybe we shouldn't do that? Maybe we should figure out how to... Nope. Okay, your investors were all on board. Everyone got it. Yeah. Uh, since then, you have acquired Refinery. I, we did. You did. Um, there's been a lot of talk about consolidation between the digital brands. Um, that's, I guess, Pop Sugar just got sold as well. That's a small one. Um, yeah. But you are the only one that actually pulled off one of these. I think you guys did some consolidation, too. We did as well. But in terms of the very big, all digital platforms, um, digital companies, that's the only deal to go through so far. W why do you think other deals haven't happened, and why did you make this one? Um, I can't speak to why other deals haven't. I mean, 
this one, obviously everyone's been looking at everything because, you know, as some of the, the, the bigger traditional um, conglomerates start to merge, that just, you know, the bankers start making calls yep. and you get caught up in the everybody looking at But you also had Jonah Preddy saying, oh, I course. think we should do this. Of course, of course. And, um, you know, I'm not a believer in scale just for scale's sake. You can get real, you know, caught up quickly in a not being able to execute you know, a, a, gr a strong integration or a strong merger or acquisition if you're only doing it for scale. Um, I think you really need to think about h how is it complementary to your business and why. Um, we looked at brand. I mean, one of the most important things that we have at Vice is the power of our brand and that that's what we know and that's, um, you know, I think that's what we're really good at and that's, that's our holy grail. And when looking at refinery, you know, brand is also something that is super important to the DNA of their organization. Um, and both, both businesses started by doing something that was brand defining for a voice, brand defining for an audience. And so, you know, the, the cultural DNA made sense. Their revenue um, is slightly more diversified and differentiated from ours. Um, like you guys, they they have more experiential revenue than we do. It's something that Vice hasn't played in yet, and 29 Rooms is is an interesting asset for us. And I think when you think about the this is like a big multimedia installation, multimedia, people pay yeah, to go you know, see it. hundreds of thousands of tickets, you know, countrywide and all the events that it drives. Um, it's a you know a data driver, an advertiser driver. Um, and, you know, Vice is a brand that drives audiences to do things and purchase things. So in the hands of, you know, their experiential expertise, I think I'm looking, I'm, I don't think I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to having those discussions with those teams in the coming year of what might that look like together. Um, and then we have a very powerful international footprint. 60% um, of Vice's eyeballs and 50% of our revenue is outside of the U.S., um, very small amount of refineries um, footprint is outside the U.S. They're only in the U.K., um, small amount in Germany, and a very small amount in um, France, and most of that is agency and branded entertainment. So your argument, led. this is how you can combine two big digital media companies without having too much and overlap. Complement. Yeah, very little overlap. Um, are there going to be cuts? Have there been cuts? We'll be making some like back office where there's, you know, we're not going to need two CFOs, mm -hmm. we're not going to need two general counsels. So all of those are ongoing now. Um, by the end of the year, we'll be done with the incremental operational, in, you know, cuts. But from an editorial standpoint, they're going to run independent and report directly to me. I wouldn't expect. Have you done a deal like this before? Where you merge two substantial companies, two substantial workforces, and figure out how to how to. I was make, part of the common? Lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. So I was running history when A and E acquired Lifetime, and then I was put over Lifetime. So that was under Abby Raven, but I was, you know, very much part. What did, what did you the learn there that you're bringing to this? You know, you can't underestimate the cultural transition. Um, I think, you know, it was five years and people were still calling it legacy lifetime. <laughs> um, and we had been, you know, a &E television yeah. networks for a long time. So, you know, I have started from day one as really approaching this as best in class. And um, Kate Ward, who ran Refinery's international team, is now going to be running Vice Media's global studio. So, you know, really coming at this from the standpoint of um, looking at all of the execs across the board, whether they be in audience growth, whether, you know, through, through and through the sales department, um, trying to impress upon our organization that this is a great opportunity to be learning on both sides and never take for granted that, you know, don't assume we know something better than they know something and vice versa. And you've got one company that is being bought by the other, and so mm -hmm. this is maybe too much HR for this discussion, but there's a bunch of people there, understandably nervous, worried. They have an, a, an idea of what they think Vice is. They have an idea of what they think Refinery is. There probably is some real differences there. Do you want to say to them, look, you get to sort of remain this distinct thing, and the things that are distinct about you are going to remain that, or... We're going to kind of onboard you in the way we do things. Oh, no, no, no. Very distinct. I mean, I think coming out of the gate and saying that editorial is going to remain distinct, it's their web, you know, their emails are still aiming at yeah. Refinery29. <laughs> um, and, and making sure that, 
you know, as much of the integration that we could do pre-closing, they were very, very engaged with and very involved in. And each team had a member from each organization that made, re you know, recommendations that laddered up to a more senior team that was comprised of Justin and myself and Philip. Um, and then, you know, right now, I am, you know, day one upon closing was at their offices. Last week was at their offices so it's in very London. Intentional. In Berlin. Tomorrow I'll be in LA. It's all very, very intentional. And I think you also have to, like, let the, the teams take some time to integrate. It, yeah. it can't all come from me. Um, this is maybe the first time today that we've said the word duopoly. We'll just talk about it now. A uh, big part of your business is selling digital ads. Smaller than you think. How, what's the percentage? Um, we are less than 35% advertising dependent. Okay, so 35% of your business is, yep. is digital advertising. Um, Facebook and Google own that business. They're not giving it up. Um, one of the arguments for these combinations is somehow that will make it give you guys more power at the bargaining table. I don't quite understand the logic. How do you, how do you how do you think about competing with Google and Facebook for those digital ad dollars? Yeah, I mean, I don't I don't think the logic of this merger makes us more powerful against Facebook and Google. So, um, and when you know, I will just caveat that the the thirty five percent also includes, don't forget, I have the cable channel mm -hmm. as well, and then that's global. So, um, you know, and it's across all platforms, not just the duopoly. I, I think, you know, it's, it's, they are what they are, and I think there's a pretty big piece of the pie left for those of us that are going to be big. And, and right now, when you, if you just want to think about the traditional, you know, traditionally defined digital media companies, the way that you started the, the conversation about, you know, the Voxes and the Vices and the refineries of the world, we're unquestionably right now the largest. And when I think about that piece of the pie that's left for, you know, traditional publishing companies that also have a really strong agency business and also have a really strong studio business, I feel pretty good about where we are. Um, let's talk about TV. You were in TV for a long time, like you said. You were very successful there. We're talking a lot about TV here. Michael Nathanson, I don't know if you saw that presentation. Um, if you're still in traditional TV and you watch Michael Nathanson's presentation, you're awfully worried if, if you're not in news and sports, mm -hmm. um, which to me leaves, that's, he's talking about A&E and scripts and lots of people who don't have live content that people have to watch. Um, one, do you, do you see any bright future for the, that old legacy TV business? And two, you guys are connected to that business. And so how do you think about how closely you want to be tethered to it? You have the A&E deal. Um, you were doing HBO stuff. You brought some of that in-house to Viceland. Yeah. Um, how do you think about sort of TV broadly and how you guys approach TV? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that TV is, it's going to be a very... Look, the cord cutting is happening faster than I think a lot of people would have anticipated. Um, but it's still, you know, I think it's going to be measured in decades, not years. And, and that's something that um, people have a hard time understanding. Um, the bundle is going to continue to morph and it'll unbundle and rebundle. And I think that there were conversations about that today. Um, if you have a strong brand, you will survive. And how you're surviving is going to look a lot different than it does today. Um, I think that if you have a, if you're a sort of a no-name channel and um, and you're not in somebody else's ecosystem, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tougher. And this was the logic of so, rebranding H2 and making it Viceland, right? Yeah. It, it drew X number of viewers, but you thought it's not going anywhere. Let's. You're let's, not going to need two of this. Right, and also channel. let's let's make something that's specifically created for a younger demographic. Yep. See how it works. Yep. You came to one of these events and someone said it's a flat line and you ripped that person's head off. <laughs> um, how, how has the Vice Land... I think I was a little nicer. They didn't have their facts straight. I'm just very nervous, is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, how, uh, what have you learned from Vice Land? I think, you know, I think how we've adjusted in the market now is, also, is, is understanding that it's going to be very hard to launch a series for 10, 15 episodes, go away for six months, eight months, 10 months, and then come back with, you know, 10 more episodes and hope that audience is going to be there. The traditional TV yeah, model. That's, that, that is, has changed, if not completely gone away, um, without being able to spend billions of dollars driving those audience to those particular, you know, 10, 20 episodes. 
And so, you know, what you'll see us do and you've already seen us do is start to move a lot of our news content to the Vice TV brand. And so- In part because that's daily. And it's daily. And so if the audience knows what's there every night, the habitual viewing is a much easier and affordable model. Um, we learned that at A&E with Live PD, right? If it's on every Friday night and every Saturday night for the 52 weeks, the audience knows to expect it. Um, hopefully the same will be true with the news product and um, you know, being able to have the newsroom and, and have different products come off of that newsroom, one of which is in support of our TV channel, I think is a big opportunity, especially when our news brand while you know, news in general is slightly older than the traditional Vice audience, is still in its late 30s, early 40s in comparison to some of the other cable news brands which are pushing 70. Yeah, I want to dramatic focus different. on that for a second. Because right, the, the pitch different. for Viceland in some ways was our brand is so strong that we're going to get these young viewers who aren't watching TV, who have cut the cord or yeah. are cord nevers, and they're going to come watch us on cable and it didn't compute. Yeah. So is that a different audience than a, a, a digital vice Well, I think, well, I mean, remember it's the average. So there's half right. the audience is, that is much younger than that and then half is, is older. And I think what we've all learned and we see it even in, in digital platforms and social platforms is that the platform is very age specific. So, you know, broadcast is older than cable. Cable is older than Facebook. Yep. Facebook is older than Snap. Snap is older than TikTok. <laughs> and so, you know, we all have to be pretty specific and bespoke in how we create content to the different platforms. And I think one of the interesting things that Vice has done is that is in our DNA, never to think that we're gonna just recut pieces of content and move it around platforms. What the organization is really good at is understanding that each platform serves a specific need. You can't take this Viceland show and cut it up and put it on Snapchat. It's pretty hard. And Snapchat, by the way, doesn't want you to do that either. Yeah. Um, we're going to open this up to questions. Um, I've got one for you before we get there. Sure. Uh, Shane Smith was yes. on this stage, still works at Vice. Yeah. Um, you're the CEO. He's still the brand artist. We talked before, you said he's still trying to sell, do, do sales yep, deals? Yeah, he's doing some sales. He did actually a special Middle East Divided that's on Hulu now. Oh, starring Shane. Starring but, he's, Shane. but he's actually in the room with advertisers trying to bring big deals to the he's table. Done, yeah, he's done some. We, he, he's, a, he's an on-command performance. But I, you know, I think one of the things that I would like to say, and I'm glad you asked, is... Um, Shane, I think, doesn't get as much credit maybe as he deserves in that when you look at the cultural movement that's gone on over the last couple of years with Me Too and, um, and a lot of the changes that have taken place in our industry and others and maybe place changes that need to have taken place, um, you know, he did one of the very unique things that not many did, and that was you know, asked a woman to step in and gave me full charge. He asked you to go work at Vice? Yes. He recruited you? Well, he asked, and yeah. then many others also recruited yeah. me. But, you know, he's never once interfered with me running the company. And I think that that's not something that many founders do easily. And how do you um, think about managing that relationship on your end? I welcome him. I mean, I think it's, you know, a founder's role to a company is very unique and one that should be respected. And, um, and I think that energy that he brings, he, no one knows the brand more than he does. And then you've got to balance that with, actually, I do run the company. And yeah. pr presumably, at some point, you guys split and or there's a natural tendency for employees to be like, should we ask Nancy or should we ask Shane? Yeah, no, because I think he's done something pretty remarkable. And that is to say, she runs the company. OK, good. Do we have questions here? Everyone's shy, they don't want to get Lucas Shaw. Oh, here we go. Hi, how are you? Um, right around the same time uh, of the news about the acquisition of Refinery, I was reading also about how you are investing heavily in virtue and the agency business. Yep. And I'm just curious to hear a little bit about your vision for that, what you feel your value prop in the marketplace is? Are you focused on specific advertiser categories, US, international? Like, what's the, what's your thoughts on it? Sure. Um, Virtue is the agency name. It's run completely independently and even is like physically located differently from Vice. Um, 
it's 50% outside the US, 50% inside, has a pretty similar um, profile. I wouldn't say that it's got a category specificity beyond that it's um, an agency that specializes in you know, youth strategy, youth marketing, youth creative for companies. So, you know, um, companies that are looking at targeting that Gen Z, you know, millennial market who are either wanting to launch products, wanting to reach those audience, so either through insights, through creative. Um, we've done a lot of work for recently with like Urban Decay. Um, and so we'll, we'll use our, you know, our music prowess, our cultural insights across Vice to feed into Virtue, but Largely, they they act pretty independent, um, and Nancy, what is Urban Decay? Urban Decay is a makeup line. That's what I thought. I didn't want to step in it. Thank you. Yeah. In case anyone else was unfamiliar as well. Um, but I, is that did that answer your? Wasn't very I have specific. A great but. eyeshadow primer. Um, but yes, it does answer my question. But it, would you say that the creative that they do is in the voice of Vice? Is there no, 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 because okay. I would, you know, Urban Decay. Um, I think it's in the voice of youth is more than I would say it's in the Vice, in the voice of Vice. Um, I think people are attracted to Virtue because it's a, a publisher-born, story-driven story agency. So it's more in the vein of like a 72 or a Widen than it is vice. I mean, most of the advertisers and the clients who are using Virtue don't use vice at all. It's not connected. Oh, so like we're, you know, Park MGM, Google Chrome, um, you know, we're doing work for Gucci. Like it's, the, it's, it's not, they, they don't necessarily intersect. Um, now where we take advantage of it is that we'll make um, content for those advertisers, obviously, and Pulse Media also has a commercial division, so Pulse might make the commercials. So we're able to, you know, connect the dots around our business. Sometimes they come together. So, for example, Bushmills has a, we did a commercial for them called Red um, Noisy on Vice, did the music with, I'm going to get this wrong, Louder is the song that was Karate, I'm, I'm just aged. Thank you, Kid Karate. Thank you. So no, the noisy <laughs> brand did, there was a million intersections. And so sometimes we make it work. Um, the other thing that we do with Virtue is that it's, and it's because of its global footprint and Vice's global footprint, um, brands like Unilever will come to us to activate really fast globally in a way that sometimes the holding companies have more challenges doing. Thank you. Last question of the night. Make it awesome. No pressure. Wow. Hey, awesome question. Um, you touched Did you on say the, your name? Oh, uh, my name's Rob. Um, you touched on it a bit earlier with Refinery. They've got 29 rooms, which I didn't know anything about, but that's kind of a broader trend in digital media companies doing these sort of like like BuzzFeed has tasty complex as like shoes Sneaker or con. sneakers. Yeah, yeah, I don't even know. Is there a world where Vice gets more into that? Yeah, absolutely. It was, a, I think, something that really attracted us to Refinery, their experiential business and their commerce business. Um, you know, it, it's, I think you, having brands have the ability to be able to drive consumers to commerce, to events, um, is the ultimate testament of one of the things that companies like ours can do that television has a hard time doing. Awesome. Thank you. Nancy, awesome. Peter, thank, thank you. you.